searching for happiness. Since we spend the greater part of our lives working, why don't we look for happiness at work? In France, in France and Germany, the percentage of engaged workers, by which I mean those who get up with a smile on their face, is 11%. Disengaged workers, those who go to work to earn a salary but take no initiative, count for 61% in France and 58% in Germany. The third category are those we call actively disengaged, who are so unhappy at work that they turn up every day merely to display their unhappiness. Basically, these are people who come to sabotage or destroy. It is possible to let employees take the initiative and reorganize things for themselves. Some companies have decided to shake up the system and invent alternative models of work. In Germany, the United States, France, India and Belgium, they're challenging preconceived ideas. Sea Smoke Cellars in California is a small company that functions in a very original way. Its owner, Bob Davids, a former head of several multinationals, applies the precept of Lao Tzu. The true leader takes no part in the action. I'm in uh, Miami. I have an apartment here. I heard that. Yeah, it's just sort of a hideout. <laughs> The 2012 is showing really well in my mind. Great. It all began 15 years ago when Bob Davids bought land for planting vines. Sea Smoke, this was going to be my retirement business. And the companies I started before, some of them got up to 8,000 people. And I found that there is a correlation that the more people you have, the less fun you have. So I wanted a company that didn't have a lot of people and was focused on fun. He recruited a small team of just six people and gave them an ambitious mission. Bob's objective was to basically produce, well, depending upon which day you catch him, the best Pinot Noir in the world or the best Pinot Noir in the United States. I'll take best Pinot Noir in the United States because it's a lower bar. <laughs> Victor Gallegos is the general manager but he doesn't take any decision without first consulting his colleagues. Bob Davids never tells them what to do. It's up to them to come up with solutions, even if they get it wrong. My job is uh, to give the questions, and your job is to give me the answer. So one of the tricks of being a leader is don't give the answers. Ask the questions until the people can get to the answers themselves, and then you catch them. The first thing is to not take other people's problems, not to take, I call them, their monkeys. In 2003, we had some very difficult weather during flowering, so we had a lot of variability in the vineyard. I called Bob on my cell phone. I had stopped working, I was retiring, and I was living in Bahamas. Hey, Victor, what's going on? I said, well, I've got some bad news. Um, you know, we've had this difficult spring. Bottom line is I have to drop a million dollars of fruit on the ground. Okay, why are you calling me? Do you think I'm qualified to make the decision? At that time, I saw that he's trying to hand me his monkey. He said, that's why I hired you. Don't try and pass me your monkey. Click. <laughs> End of conversation. That's Bob. So no ego, like he's acting like he's the guy who's gonna make all the decisions. He gave us the objective, he hired the right people, and he leaves us alone. With Bob, it's kind of a double-edged sword, too, because when you're given all of the liberties and all of the trust to do your job and do it well, you better perform, because you have no excuses at that point. And it worked for Bob, too. Every year, Katie sells around 150,000 bottles via internet at an average price of 60 euros. Do the math. Sea Smoke is a real success story. Delegating responsibility and giving freedom is clearly possible with a small staff, 
But how do you do that with a company of 1,400 employees? Founded by Émile Poult in 1883 in Montauban in the south of France, the Poult Group is a major player in the biscuit market. Nicole has been working here for 30 years. She knew the company when it operated along traditional lines. Hi, what's up? It used to be a strict hierarchy. We had a factory manager, staff manager, four men, and production line managers. The company had a strict hierarchical culture. There were the underlings. We were like soldiers, robots. Turn up, do what you're told, don't ask questions. And the chiefs. I was a production line chief. I was responsible for just one line. I had to sort out people's holidays, conflicts, if there were any, and be sure that the line was functioning without a hitch and everything has to do with that. We were watched really closely and strictly regimented about what we should and shouldn't do. We'd soon end up in the office if we'd been a bit naughty. In 2001, with Poult in serious difficulties, along came Carlos Verkeren, a Belgian entrepreneur who used to work for an investment fund. He settled in Montauban, determined to turn Poult around with a new approach. Close down factories, sack people, cut costs, anyone can do that. You don't need to be fantastically qualified. You just have to lack a bit of sensitivity and go for it. But to turn things around through innovation, new products, that's more complicated. That's what we decided to do. In 2006, he gathered everyone employed at the factory for a brainstorming session. Everyone was invited to come up with new ideas, whatever their job or their position in the hierarchy. We were invited to take part in this new organization right across the board from top management down to simple employees like me. And they asked us, how do you envisage the factory in the future? How could things be improved? And things like that. Working groups were set up to meet and continue the discussions. After a great many meetings, it was decided to get rid of all intermediary hierarchical posts. We didn't just say, let's get rid of the chiefs. After lots of meetings and thinking, we finally realized that, yes, we could keep a production line going perfectly well without someone to oversee it. Well, there was a clash because when you have a hierarchical position and overnight it's taken away, you, you really have to come to terms with accepting that. Most of the former chiefs left because they felt that losing their titles sort of diminished them in the outside world. They were no longer chiefs. They lost their power, so I think they felt um, underestimated. For the former bosses, it may have been a hard pill to swallow. But the other employees weren't necessarily any more enthusiastic at first. Lots of people were against it, including employees like me. They thought we were heading straight to the wall. It's a lot easier just to be given orders, to have someone tell you what to do. You don't have to think, you just do it. Now, when we tell teams, decide for yourself, it's a lot harder, it takes longer, it can cause tensions, and the team has to deal with that. You could always blame the chief before, but now there isn't any. Nowadays, all decisions are taken by small groups representative of the entire company. The pallets, where should I put them? You stuff some here and you stuff some there, and soon you don't know where the products are. We have to decide on the exact zone for each item. There are a lot of things that chiefs did before, and someone still has to do them. So operators developed new skills, took on specific tasks. For example, they do all the planning, the scheduling of the production week, who's going to be on holiday, who's not there, the clocking in. There's no hierarchy anymore structuring everything. To everyone's surprise, it worked. Poult is recruiting and is back in profit. In fact, it's such a success that other large companies have been sending human resources teams to the Montauban factory to learn their secret. They think we're Martians. <laughs> we're like Martians. Poult is what's called a liberated company. 
The term was coined by Brian Carney and Isaac Getz in their book, Freedom Inc. Isaac Getz is a professor of management and innovation who studied over 200 companies around the world to define his concept. We define a liberated company as one in which a large majority of the employees are given total freedom and responsibility to undertake all the actions which they themselves, not the superiors nor procedures, judge to be best for the company. But liberating a company in this way is a tricky undertaking, because almost every business has its quota of little bosses. According to Jean-François Zobrist, a flagship boss of liberated companies, there are way too many. About 3% of a company's employees are time wasters. And because of them, a structure has been set up to manage the other 97 who are serious. And workers are bullied by the structure. They accomplish barely 50% of what they're capable. It's not just workers who are stifled by this structure. Over the last 30 years, with the rise of information technology, industrial management norms have been applied to all professions, with a multiplication of the number of advisory, managerial, supervisory and monitoring posts, putting a stranglehold on the employees. The result is a sense of disembodiment in the modern world of work, a deep unease in one's job. A professor at the London School of Economics, American anthropologist David Graeber has an explanation. He puts it down to the huge increase in what he calls bullshit jobs. There just seems to be a general principle that the more obviously your work benefits other people, the less they pay you. You know, there's a few exceptions. There's doctors, airline pilots, they, act, you know, they do something that's clearly necessary and they get paid well. But for the most part, the kind of people whose work is really a obvious social benefit, whether it's a nurse, whether it's a garbage collector. If we didn't have garbage collectors, we'd be in big trouble. If we didn't have human resource consultants, it's not clear how the world would be in any way a different place. If we didn't have corporate lawyers or, or hedge fund advisors, it might well be distinctly better. <laughs> the more negative your social benefits, the more money you get. Workers feed everyone. We often forget that. Workers feed the bosses and management. Incidentally, management never goes on strike. But when the workers stop, there's a problem right away. The only knowledge of the West is our workers. All it takes is to liberate them. The management structure has experienced foremen and team leaders, but they're confined to a control function. They have to control since they're controlled by the rest of the hierarchy. Above all things, make good use of your time. For all my life, I've been meeting people who had jobs that they would secretly confide to me didn't really do anything. It seems I keep meeting more and more of them as time goes on. Um, there are certain types of position which build up constantly in large bureaucratic organizations, and I'm including corporations especially in this, which are essentially people who make work for other people who do similar things. They're just pushing papers back and forth between desks, designing new forms of audit culture, new ways of assessing people who are assessing other people. What's paradoxical about this confused era is that the more money they lose, the more control they apply. It's a vicious cycle. They're constantly talking about efficiency, downsizing. But when they downsize, they seem to strip down to the minimum the, the number of people who are actually making, maintaining, fixing, moving things, who are actually doing the work. But they actually, they often seem to create even more of the people in the middle who don't really do anything. These people fire the productive staff, they fire the salesmen, because if things aren't going well, it's obviously the fault of the salesmen, right? And they hire unproductive people. None of these people actually do anything that's really socially necessary, but there's an escalation process. And a lot of the bureaucratic stuff seems to operate in a very similar way. It's a need created by the fact that other people think that there's a need, and it feeds off itself.
Deep in Picardy, in northern France, at Jean-Francois Zobrist's former company, Favi, there are no bullshit jobs. The godsend at Favi is the gearbox fork. Over the last 20 years, this foundry has worked its way up to the top rank of European suppliers of this hard-wearing copper alloy car part. The company is so successful, it even exports to China, which isn't well known for importing industrial parts from France. In 1983, Jean-Francois Zobrist, a former soldier, took the reins of this family business with its dispirited workforce. He implemented his original ideas to turn it into a model of innovative practices. And his methods clearly worked, because people now are clamouring to get hired here. Oh yes, I'm very happy. Actually, when I was told that I got the job, I was so happy, I cried. So contented are Fabi's 400 employees, there isn't even a union. There's no union at Favi, there's just a workers' committee. The managing director is president of the workers' council. No, we've never had a union. No, I don't think it's necessary. Not with our ways of working. At Favi, they have an extremely original way of working. The hierarchy has been reduced to a minimum. The director and then the employees, who organize themselves. To reach this state of affairs, Jean-Francois Zobrist applied two basic principles. Man is good and love the customer. Man is good, so there's no need for supervision. I have confidence in the workers and the salespeople. They can organize themselves so they're happy. Jean-Francois Zobrist began by creating autonomous teams of people who get on well together to run centers of production known as mini factories, each linked to a customer. So Bruce's big idea in the beginning was having these mini factories on a human scale, where everyone knows everyone else. This gradually led to the overall destructured setup. Rapidly, these mini factories proved highly profitable. So much so that Favi has been able in good years to give its employees a bonus worth three months' salary. All that from just letting people do things their own way. Trust gets better results than control. The cost of overseeing things is so bloated that any problem caused by the absence of control costs nothing in comparison. So it's a matter of principle for us not checking up on production rates or working hours, nothing. Running a company with no hierarchical control sounds good on paper, but what happens when you have problems with a particular employee? Say, when a lone shirker puts a spanner in the works. What happens when something goes wrong? Well, usually bosses intervene to set things straight again. Now, if someone shows up late for work, it probably means he had a problem of some sort. If it's repeated, it's sorted out first within the manufacturing, because a missing operator throws off the work of the whole team. I try and have a talk with the person about what's wrong. Is he having problems? Does he feel uncomfortable in that mini factory? Would he like to try something else? That's how it works. So 10% of the time you go beyond the system, it doesn't work. But 90% of the problems are sorted out on the spot. When you control everything, bad apples thrive. When you control nothing, the bad apples get rooted out, but in a nice way. Generally speaking, those who don't fit in in the Favi system don't stay long. They leave of their own accord. Some people like having someone behind them telling them what to do all the time. The people at Favi prefer responsibility and having more freedom. Jean-Francois Zobrist didn't come up with this successful way of doing things all by himself. He found inspiration in various different models, sharing these ideas with his teams. On the 
êtes allé au Japon en 2004, 2004 we went to visit some companies in Japan. The Japanese culture is completely different. I think that for the Japanese, the company comes before the family. They live for the company, which isn't exactly the case here. From the Japanese, they took the notion of kaizen, or continuous improvement, adapting it to the Favi way of doing things. We're continually improving at Favi, using the Kaizen principle backed up with rewards. Ideas for improvement are implemented in order to increase productivity, safety, ergonomics and overall well-being at the workstations. We have a little box at the staff entrance for anyone who has an idea. And once a month, a jury meets and awards a prize to the two best ideas. The first prize of 1,000 euros is paid over a five-month period, as the second of 500 euros. It's great. Uh, you have a good idea and you're rewarded for it. The last idea I had was a change in the packaging. One of our packages held six pieces, but by changing the way the pieces were placed in the box, we managed to get eight in every box. This improved productivity, reduced the number of boxes we used, and I won 1,000 euros. Kaizen or continuous improvement, was first applied in Japan after the Second World War. The country's elite had been wiped out and industry was in a catastrophic state. Some way was needed of motivating the workers and coming up with a whole new way of working. In 1947, Japan was still under American occupation. The American sent a consultant, William Edwards Deming, who suggested a new system, lean management. Toyota was one of the first companies to implement it. The Japanese came up with a certain number of approaches, such as Kaizen, continuous improvement, all based on the assumption that to solve problems on the shop floor, no one is better placed than the person on the shop floor. To sum up, he who does, knows. Deming's concept is based on respecting the intelligence of the worker. For him, by simplifying the hierarchy, you make gains in productivity and you reduce costs. With its highly motivated workforce, Japan rapidly became an industrial powerhouse. From the 1960s, Japanese products began to flood the world. This was not to the liking of Western competitors. The arrival of high-performance Japanese motorbikes in the United States seriously troubled the historical manufacturer Harley-Davidson, based in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. By the end of the 1970s, Harley-Davidson's technology was lagging behind, and a massive strike brought the bike maker to its knees. In 1981, the company was over $70 million in debt. A new financial director, Rich Tierlink, was brought in to turn the situation around. He took inspiration from Japanese lean management ideas. Basically said we had to adopt some Japanese techniques of just-in-time inventory, employee involvement, those types of things. And that started to get us to understand more fully that our biggest assets are the people who walk through the door every day. At first, employees and unions were suspicious. In order to get off on the right foot, Rich Tierlink asked for everyone, together, to rethink the company's way of doing things. They came up with some very simple things. Let's tell the truth. Let's be fair. Let's keep our promises. Let's respect the individual and let's encourage intellectual curiosity. The message quickly spread, with even the dealers getting on board. These were values of integrity. I think uh, 
to some people it's common sense, but to others they don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I think it was essential to have those discussions in those early days. Following these consultations, the entire decision-making process was transformed. The human factor was now at the heart of the company's way of functioning, and it pleased the unions. Rich flattened the management structure. Instead of all the bureaucracies at the different levels, he uh, devised a system of circles, which took out a lot of the barriers between just the salaried people, management, and the union. Each plant had a circle of leaders that would actually make the decisions on what to do. So we were able to talk, share ideas, explore avenues we haven't ever gone down before. The employees started catching on very quickly because it was like, okay, I can actually talk to you without being fired. Your door is open, hello. But the biggest challenge was to get the people with the highest titles to buy in. If they couldn't do it, get that concept in their mind, wrap their heart and soul around it, you don't belong here. In the end, we were able to convince 99.9% .9 of the people that uh, this was a good thing. With this new atmosphere of trust, the freshly liberated teams came up with a number of revolutionary innovations. And we saw a new engine design. Uh, we saw a new chassis and a new way to mount the motor and transmission in those chassis. We saw cosmetic enhancements, uh, electronic enhancements, a better engineered product. Sales took off and salaries, as well as pensions, were soon raised. Riding this creative wave, one employee came up with an idea which would seal the Harley-Davidson legend. If we could create a club that would give the riders a reason to get together on the weekends, they would put more miles on the motorcycle. That's how a unique brotherhood was born around the love of the machine, the Harley Owners Group. So all of a sudden, the, the dealer had a new way to attract his customers and to build a relationship with his customers. It really has been one of the best things I can say personally that's happened to me in life. The relationships I've met uh, in this organization are, are friends that, uh, that I'll cherish forever. Numbering employees as well as customers, the Harley Owners Group has become a family with more than a million members around the world. Everyone's creativity was tapped to get the manufacturer out of its rut and growing again. But for some employees, things changed in 1997, when Rich Tierlink retired. I cried when they announced that he was retiring. And uh, things changed dramatically. As time went on, uh, the circle concept started to deteriorate. It was a hierarchy again. Instead of the employee becoming the most important thing, money became the most important thing. So how can you make happiness at work into something that lasts? What's the secret of keeping workers happy and productive in a large multinational. In the 1950s, Bill Gore had some very innovative ideas. At the time, Bill Gore was working as a chemist for chemical giant DuPont. He repeatedly suggested studying new applications for Teflon, but got only systematic refusals from his superiors. In frustration, he decided to start his own family company in 1958. Soon after, his son invented a new material which would go on to be used in the clothing of firemen and ramblers the world over, Gore-Tex. Remembering his frustrating experiences at DuPont, 
Bill Gore came up with a new philosophy for his business. Make money and have fun doing so. With 10,000 employees spread over five continents, Gore generates an annual turnover of $3 billion. And it does it by giving its employees a surprising amount of freedom. Occasionally someone asks me, Bill, how do you control all these 20 odd plants or whatever they are scattered around the world? I tend to laugh and I say, well, I don't. 55 years later, the Gore culture has survived the demise of its creator and the current president fondly remembers her own beginnings in the company. I had just uh, graduated and the Gores were so proud of this new crop of engineers coming into uh, to their enterprise that they had a pool party at their house. And I remember Bill Gore swimming in the pool and Vive was actually uh, cooking burgers. And I just said, that's how every CEO treats their employees. They invite you over to the house, right? And I'm thinking about that now. My house is not big enough for 10,000 associates. 10,000 associates? At Gore, they're not employees, but associates. And all of them have shares in the company, which isn't listed on the stock exchange. No one must feel their creativity is being stifled. Every associate is free to take the initiative without being thwarted by some minor boss. Bill Gore didn't want any hierarchy in his company. He wanted everyone to be free to develop their own talents. But an absence of hierarchy isn't the same thing as anarchy. Bill Gore came up with a system of leaders picked by their own teams. Ideally, it just becomes obvious who the leader can be. The associates like working with someone because that person is competent, has a vision, and thus is a natural leader. But sometimes it's not so obvious. So we organize sessions to evaluate leaders, and the associates can suggest those who in their mind have leadership potential. A Zen atmosphere. Myra isn't a guru, however. Her job title at Gore is European Diversity Champion. She organizes personal development workshops, drums and all. During the sessions, you get beautiful moments when all of a sudden a new door opens. I was working with a colleague who had often been offered the job of a leader, but she was very reluctant, always doubting herself, wondering whether she deserved it and whether she was really capable. But after working on herself, she realized it was a real step forward in her life. Another surprise. The associates here aren't recruited for their qualifications, but for their potential to develop and come up with new ideas, which are, of course, rewarded. Quite a while ago, we took on someone who was actually a butcher. But he caught on quick and was very good at developing the manufacturing process. He's now a leader in manufacturing. He had no technical qualifications, no university degree. But he progressed to his current position purely through talent, enthusiasm and the support of his sponsor. The sponsor, another of Bill Gore's inventions to help create bonds within the company. Every associate is taken under the wing of a sponsor who will help them to develop independently of their leader. With their sponsor's guidance, they soon build up a network. Today, Pascal is getting together with his sponsor Norbert, who's been his mentor since he came to Gore five years ago. If Pascal comes up with a good idea or invents something, I'll put him in touch with the right people, give him the benefit of my own network, so that his idea gets taken up. When I meet up with my sponsor, it's to get his take from the outside on some problem I might be having, or maybe about something positive. And he can say, look, you've got this option or that option. 
He might see an option which hadn't occurred to me. He lay it out and, who knows, it may just be what I was looking for. That's how it works for me. Bill Gore's motto, make money and have fun doing so, isn't just a catchy soundbite. Every associate must be free to develop their personal project within the company and genuinely have fun in the process. That's why everyone is given guidance to find their sweet spot. Another Gore concept, which may be the secret of the company's success. The sweet spot is the point where the talents and interests of an associate meet the needs of the company. The idea is when you, might in seinem when you reach spot your sweet spot, you're maximizing your contribution without even feeling that you're working. Even though it is work, you don't feel like you're working, you're enjoying, you do your work with great pleasure, it's fun. Thanks to the sweet spot, the company's creative and highly motivated associates have developed thousands of new ideas, helping the Gore empire to diversify into many different domains. From cables to clothing, road surfaces, all sorts of products used in the aerospace industry, mechanical engineering, arms, even medicine. Following up the suggestion of one young engineer, Gore even went into the guitar string business. With his motto, make money and have fun doing so, Bill Gore showed true pioneering spirit. More recently, in India, Vinit Nayar has gone even further. As the visionary CEO of IT company HCL Technologies, Vinit Nayar tripled the number of employees from 30,000 to 90,000 with his doctrine, employees first, customers second. For him, we're facing a problem of generational conflict. When you go at home and you deal with your teenagers and sit across a dining table, do you command them and tell them what you want them to do and do they follow? Or has the structure within the house moved away from command and control into more collaboration? Where the leader of the house, which is the husband and the wife, are assuming a role more of mentoring, of influencing thought and enabling the children to be able to do what they really want to do. Now that is completely different to the past where the leader of the house, uh, especially my grandfathers and even my father, was all about command and control. You'll do engineering and we did engineering. You'll be a bureaucrat and you become a bureaucrat. So that has dramatically changed. Now the critical question out here is, if the way you interact with your teenagers at home has changed compared to the way you interacted with your parents, why are you not seeing this change in work? So the reason I call this pyramid structure suffocating for Gen Y is because they're different. Now, would the organizations need to evolve to adopt to the Gen Y or do Gen Y need to adopt uh, to the old traditional organizations? Today, I think that struggle is taking place. But if you see the startup organizations, especially coming out of Bay Area and a lot of small startups, they figured this out. They figured out that the more collaborative culture is how we can get the best out of Gen Y, how we can get the most innovation out of Gen Y. And that is the reason they're creating open structures and not the old traditional structures. Open structures, the much talked about economy of sharing. Maybe it's in California that we'll find the ultimate expression of happiness at work. Jaron Lanier, a musician, philosopher and computer scientist, has got to know the major IT companies very well over the last 30 years. But he's far from enthusiastic. When you free people from the 19th century hierarchy, you tend to instead transfer them into a 21st century hierarchy, which is worse. Consider something like Facebook, where it seems like it's very open, everybody connects to everybody, except it's all owned by one person and controlled by one person, which is amazing. It's a public company owned by one person. That combination is extraordinary and it wasn't possible before, but digital networks allow you to concentrate so much wealth and so much power that it becomes possible to have an outcome like that. 
So in a sense you have um, almost a return to the Pasha or the, you know, the God King or something like that. You know, it's, it's really a return to ancient, ancient times. It's like, it's worse than the 19th century. An hour and a half of traffic jams from San Francisco, Silicon Valley has become the world capital of IT and cutting edge companies. All the giants of the digital economy are here. Google, supposedly the champion in every category of happiness at work. But also Apple, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook and the rest. Most have a reputation for being extraordinary places to work. Isaac Getz has studied how they function. In Silicon Valley, IT programmers could easily quit their jobs at any moment and go off and find something better paid. So how do you hold on to them? Well, if you lay on free food, massage salons, yoga rooms, sports facilities, free transport, and so on, employees will say, wow, it's a fantastic company and it's really nice to work here. But that has nothing to do with the content of the work, and it's completely different from liberated companies, where people say, it's a fantastic company because they trust me, because they're considerate to me, because they respect me, because I'm fulfilled there. Salaries are important. So are sports clubs, health benefits, free lunches, and a company car. But ultimately, are these the things that make you happy at work? In any case, Vinit Nayar doesn't believe money can buy you happiness. And it's a saying even more relevant today than ever. Money is important as a tool of recognition. Money is important for telling people that you are being fair. Uh, money is a way of uh, taking care of your people if the company is doing well. From all those aspects, money is important. Where do we go wrong with this? We go wrong where we believe money is the only reason for employees to work for you. So organizations which are only focused on money will get it wrong. Organizations have to be fair and square and compensate people well. But there is 70% of happiness doesn't come from just money, it comes from sense of purpose, giving people the freedom of choice, giving the freedom of transparency and getting people to play the game they want to play. Money doesn't motivate people. It motivates people for a very, very short time. What motivates people is respect, is trust, is knowing they are doing things which are bigger than themselves and they are doing it with other people. It's a bit of brotherhood feeling. Also, this, this is what motivates people. And they want to work for organizations which are looked well upon by society. Frank van Massenhove is a Belgian senior civil servant. He arrived in 2002 at the head of a moribund Ministry of Social Security with a mission to get things moving. We were an ordinary, old-fashioned ministry. And the biggest problem was, how do we get the people we need? Because the people didn't want to work here. They thought we were bland, we were boring, we had a boring job, and it wasn't. So we were thinking about young people. We call them the millennials, people who are born after 1984, 1985. How do they think? What is their culture? And we wanted to have an institution which has their culture, not our culture. The first thing we thought was they don't want us to tell them when they have to work and where they have to work. The first stage was to make it possible for people to work from home for up to three days a week. Three days a week at home for a father with an eight-year-old child is wonderful. Yesterday I fetched my son from school, helped him with homework, and then did another couple of hours work in the evening. Classic workday, maybe a bit shorter than usual. But how does working from home work? Near Leuven, Kern Vlemix is working from home on pension reform. Come in. My computer is linked to the Federal Public Service Network. We also have instant messaging software, so I'm in direct contact with my colleagues. 
It works well. There's not really any need to see each other in the flesh the whole time. And if I need to study a document, for example, I prefer doing so at home because I can really concentrate. No one is forced to work from home, of course. Each person is free to do what they feel most comfortable doing. There are people who live alone and prefer coming to the office every day. They see people every day, like before, maybe a little bit less, but they do see people every day. The drawback is that you're available evenings and weekends, but that's not really abused. Under normal circumstances, no one bothers you in the evening or at the weekend. Everyone's working hours are respected. With the new system, the ministry's results improved greatly in a very short time. The fear that we could have had is that people would be less motivated if they were working from home. But in fact, it's the opposite. Since we brought these new rules in, the treatment time for completing a file has been reduced from about 18 months to almost four and a half months. That's a huge gain. A huge gain. And yet midweek, there doesn't seem to be much work going on here. The reason being that a large proportion of the ministry's 5,000 employees are working from home. Another advantage is that, needing less office space than before, the ministry has managed to make considerable savings. The funds thus freed have gone towards creating bright open office spaces, while also sorting out a few technical problems along the way. This is the Verhaders. This is a conference room, although at first sight it might not look like one. Through there, too, there's a conference room, but as you can see, there's no wall between the two. Which means we have to be very careful about noise. When two groups are having meetings at the same time, we must ensure they don't disturb each other. To help with this, we installed an active noise reduction system, so we can work in a nice, calm atmosphere. It's more or less the same atmosphere wherever you go, one that's conducive to communication. Nobody has their own office. As you can see, everyone just works where they like. I also work in a different place every day, in the midst of my colleagues. Although some middle managers at the ministry didn't much like the change in status, they didn't really have any say in the matter. For 80% of our middle management, that was not a problem. But for 20%, it was a problem. And 10% was a real problem. And so what did we do? We let middle management be evaluated by their people. And when they got a bad evaluation, they were no longer boss. So they had to change. There was no alternative. Once a year, I get to evaluate my boss, explain what's not working, and what could be improved to make the team work better and get better results. We need people management. And so when people think their bosses are no good coaches, are not working on their competences, on the functioning of teams. They throw them out in reality, and we throw them out. Even better, one can speak one's mind freely. The employees are encouraged to speak up on social media for better or for worse. In most of the organizations, you are not supposed to be on social media during the working hours, but we don't have working hours. So we beg our people to be on social media. We have just one simple rule. You always should tell the truth. But the truth can be a truth which is not very good for us. We don't care. If it is the truth, they can tell it. And every time we go out and we say we have a problem, people say fantastic what they are doing. For Vinit Nayar, who now gets invited by top bosses around the world to come and share his avant-garde ideas, transparency must begin at the highest level of the company. Before digital, we used to communicate, right? So CEOs and management will communicate something and people had no, no means of knowing what our real intention were. With digital coming in, with everything we communicate, there is a digital world out there where people exchange notes and your true intention is known. If you communicate something else and your intention is something else, you will be discovered and you will lose huge amount of credibility and after that you will not be able to win the confidence. Communication has lost its relevance. Intention is the most important. 
So as leaders, your intention should be very clear and communicate honestly what your intention is and you will earn the trust. Trust. That's something society as a whole is sorely in need of. Isn't the current downturn a crisis of trust? The system itself is crumbling. We have a debt situation, an inequality situation, an environmental situation, which is clearly untenable. The problem is we also have a political class that is so heavily invested in the idea that any kind of visionary politics is impossible, that they're no longer capable of any kind of reaction appropriate to the scale of the problem. We also need to think about the world we're living in, in which the human aspect is always the first factor we can adjust. It's always short-term. In fact, we're in a short-term dictatorship. And yet everyone agrees that we have to improve job security, escape poverty, create employment, re-industrialize the country. Faced with all these problems, I'm firmly convinced that the company has an important role to play, an essential role. And this leads to another reflection, which is that most companies are neither very innovative nor very inspiring. So we have to do things differently. 